Good morning. Welcome to worship here this morning, a beautiful day the Lord has given us where we get to uh, open up our scriptures and continue in Mark chapter 6, uh, picking up the story where Jesus has fed the 5,000 and now he continues to send the disciples off and uh, we're going to see one of the classic miracles, uh, one of the ones that uh, everybody probably knows, uh, Jesus walking on water. And as we look at this uh, miraculous uh, uh, evidence of his divinity that he gives to the disciples, uh, we get to kind of dive in and see what is, what is the, the true message that he's uh, trying to, pers- per, to, to give to the disciples there. Uh, what, is he, what is he trying to demonstrate? What, what's he trying to, to show and to prove uh, by this miracle? And what do they take away from it? So blessings on your worship today. Uh, let's see here. Announcements-wise, uh, a couple announcements here. We got first the, the men's luncheon is coming up. That's going to be on August 10th. And uh, in August, and um, that's a Saturday, and uh, it's going to be a special kind of luncheon at Gary Gabram's house. Uh, so there is an RSVP, so let the, the church office know if you're coming, and cost is $10 a person. But again, that's August 10th. And then looking ahead, Rally Day this year will be on August 25th. So mark your calendars, write that down. Uh, That'll be a single 1030 service on Rally Day morning to be outside. And then we'll have the corn roast following directly after. Uh, So just be sure to get that on your calendars. Always a fun morning. Um, And I think that's it. So blessings on your worship. And let us begin here today with confession and absolution. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We pause for a moment of silent reflection upon our sin. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together hymn number 557, Seek Where You May to Seek Where You May to Find a Way.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, the protector of all who trust in you, strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading for this morning is from Genesis chapter nine, verses eight through 17. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all fresh flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The epistle for this morning is from Ephesians chapter three, verses 14 through 21. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And whenever he came, and wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countrysides, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many touched it were made well. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we sing together hymn number 719, I Leave All Things to God's Direction.
Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In order to get into the swing of today's text, let's review last week's story a little bit. Do you remember last week's text, the the feeding of the 5,000? Do you remember how we got there? Jesus and his disciples, they try to sneak off in the boat and leave the crowd behind because they needed some alone time to rest and relax. Jesus was just too popular for his own good because the people wouldn't even give him time to eat, let alone rest or mourn the death of John the Baptist. But sneaking off didn't work. 5,000 men plus women and children run up the shore of the Sea of Galilee to be there when Jesus' boat lands. So Jesus abandons his plans for some solitude and starts preaching and healing. All these people are still there when dinner time rolls around, but they only have five loaves of bread and two fish. So Jesus blesses the food, and miraculously, the disciples hand out enough food to feed all the gathered thousands. This is the scene that happens immediately before our gospel story today. And remember, all this happens during the time that Jesus had wanted to get some solitude. So after feeding the 5,000, the text continues with Jesus again trying to get that time of rest for him and his disciples. But the multiplication of food didn't make this any easier. In fact, now the people see Jesus as some combination of educator, healthcare provider, and caterer, right? And everybody loves somebody who provides food, especially back then. I mean, I think about a a, a nation. Think about what a nation could accomplish if their king could multiply the food supply and heal all their diseases, right? Clearly, that's the candidate they'd vote for. So it's not a big jump to understand what comes next. It's not in our text for today, but the Gospel of John records how at this point the crowd gets it in their heads to come and take Jesus by force in order to make him their king. Which doesn't seem like the kind of thing you'd have to talk most people into, but Jesus knows that that's not his role not in the way that they are thinking, at least. Jesus takes this as his cue, that he really needs to give the crowd some time away from him in order to simmer down and get that own, that time of solitude for him and the disciples, right? And I think what happens next is is telling in a way. The first thing he does is send the 12 disciples away. The text tells us that he made the disciples get into the boat and go on to the other side without him. His plan was to stay and and dismiss the crowds himself and to pray. Now, I just can't imagine the disciples being on board with this plan, though. There's no way they're just going to leave Jesus behind with this excited crowd of probably 10,000 plus people. So this must have been a bit of a fight. But I think Jesus knows that he needs to get the disciples out of there. First, because if anybody's going to get behind this idea of making Jesus king, it's the 12 disciples. Of course they want Jesus to be the king. Not only do they know best what he's capable of, but they have a vested interest in his rise to power. They were with Jesus on the ground floor. They are his closest companions. King Jesus would be a very good guy to be close to. And nobody was closer to Jesus than these 12. To go from fishermen to best friends of the king is a pretty good step up for a two-year time investment. So Jesus has to send the disciples away first, and I'm sure it's against their will. But that's the benefit of being the one in charge. So Jesus makes them get into the boat and sends them off to meet up with him later, somehow in Bethsaida across the sea. And somehow Jesus, he manages to dismiss the crowds too, which that seems like a miracle on its own, right? The Bible doesn't tell us how that was done. Maybe he just told everyone the next meal he was going to multiply would be a vegan broccoli casserole or something. (laughs) However it was accomplished, he dismissed the crowds and proceeded up the mountain to pray. 
and then it gets late. Now the scripture tells us that the disciples' boat was roughly three miles off the shore and that he was going and that the going was tough because there was wind against them and the water was pretty choppy. But at the same time, you know, the boat's not about to go down or anything. They just had hard labor rowing against that all night. They can handle it. Half of them are professional fishermen. It's just not ideal conditions. But disappointingly, then they are confronted by something that they don't know how to handle. Even with all they've seen following Jesus, they still react disappointingly. I've often thought that it, it plays out almost like a scene from Scooby-Doo. I know, I probably watched too many cartoons growing up or something like that, but bear with me, right? It's, it's somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m., Darkness and mist are covering the choppy waters when suddenly, what's that off in the distance? Peter stands up and he declares, Zoinks, it's a ghost. <laughs> I mean, what else could it be, right? It's a figure standing out on the water. In the middle of the wind and the waves, there stood this haunting apparition. And you see what happens? The Bible tells us that now, now, the disciples become terrified. The storm they can handle, but a guy walking on the water terrifies them. They cried out in fear. They just didn't understand this whole walking on water miracle. It's like the joke about the, the young man from Alaska who had heard stories growing up of a, an incredible family tradition. His father and grandfather always told him about how they had been able to walk on water for their 18th birthdays. As they told it, they'd each stepped off the family dock, and just like Jesus, they'd walked across the lake. So when the young man's 18th birthday came around with his father and grandfather watching on, he eagerly walked, walked down the dock and stepped out onto the water, only to splash down it. And he got up and he tried again and again, only to sink down each time to growing laughter from his father and grandfather. Angry and confused, the young man ran to his grandmother. Grandma, it's my 18th birthday. Why can't I walk across the lake like my father and his father before him? And the grandmother looked at her grandson and shook her head. Oh, sweetie, what they didn't tell you is that your father and grandfather were born in the middle of winter. Get it? The lake was frozen. <laughs> well, that's one way to walk on water. Though it wouldn't have frightened the disciples like Jesus' little walkabout did. Now, this frightened the disciples because this isn't something that's ever been done before. So they think it's a ghost. But it's not a ghost. This is the Son of God. You know, just out for a, a leisurely stroll upon the water. It's late, it's dark. The wind is blowing and the waves are crashing and Jesus is walking. Now this verse contains a Greek word that I've always kind of liked. It's hidden here in the English, but the word here in the Greek is for walk is peripateo. And we actually have an English word that's taken from this. It's the adjective peripatetic, but it's one of those words that you probably only ever use in Scrabble or on an SAT test or something like that. This word in Greek and English, it means to take just kind of a casual walkabout, a stroll along the path, a walk down the beach, or if you're Jesus, you know, a little jaunt across, across the waves. The point is that Jesus, he isn't running, jumping, or struggling against the water. He isn't, you know, tripping over the swells. No, he's just casually taking a walk out on it. He makes it look easy. Which is why when Jesus calls out to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid, Peter stands up and responds. And we don't get this part in our text today because this Peter interaction, it isn't recorded in the Gospel of Mark. It, it comes from Matthew's Gospel. But Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come out to you on the water. And Jesus does. So Peter, he steps out onto the water, he makes it about to where Jesus is, but then he, he takes his eyes off Jesus and he sees the storm. He becomes afraid. Which brings us to ourselves. 
we know what that feels like with the storms of our lives. How often have you found yourself caught outside the boat, surrounded by the wind and waves, so to speak? How often have you had one of those moments where you feel like you can't trust in the things that you normally can and you start to lose your composure in the midst of the turmoil of this life? It happens to everyone. But the key is to trust. Though perhaps easier said than done, I know, because doubt has a way of creeping in, doesn't it? It's part of our sinful nature. We doubt. We lose sight of our faith. We turn away from Jesus and we focus on the difficulties of our life. And just like Peter, we begin to sink. The miracle fades as quickly as our faith and we find ourselves neck deep in water. And it's not the kind of thing we like to brag about, is it? I think this helps explain why this whole Peter interaction isn't recorded in the Gospel of Mark. See, remember that Mark was not one of the 12 disciples. He wasn't an eyewitness. Mark was a student of Peter's after Christ's death and resurrection. Mark records what Peter taught. And I think it's telling that it seems as if Peter, when recounting this story to Mark years later, perhaps left out the whole part about his attempting to walk on water, losing faith, and needing to be rescued by Jesus. Probably an embarrassing moment for him. So he leaves that part out of the story as he tells it. Thankfully, Matthew was there, and he saw the whole thing, and he doesn't mind telling us all about Peter's embarrassing moment. I've always said the disciples are far more competitive than we like to imagine them being. But you see this story, I don't think it's here to show us how big of a doubter Peter is. I don't think it's here to show us just that, that Jesus can do cool things like walk on water. I've always thought that the lesson here is found in what happens while Peter is sinking. See, Peter's going down, right? He thinks it's all over. The end has come. But do you know what Jesus does in situations like that? Remember what Jesus did here? He reaches out. He takes Peter by the hand. Standing there on the water, Jesus immediately reaches out his hand and catches Peter. He wasn't going to let him drown. And the same thing goes for you and me. When we find ourselves sinking into the depths of our own fears, doubts, and insecurities, when we feel like we're drowning in our problems, buffeted by our sin, engulfed in a storm that seems impossible to navigate, Jesus is there. He reaches out his hand and catches us. Not because we've earned it or because we're worthy, but because of his unending love for us. Isn't that comforting? Even if you're going through the roughest storm of your life right now, even if you feel like you're on the brink of drowning in the tumultuous waves of your troubles, Jesus is with you. He won't let you be swept away. He's there to lift you up and lead you back to the boat. We, we cannot walk on water alone. Just as Peter learned he couldn't do it by his self, we too must understand that our strength comes from Christ. It's not about how, strength, how strong we are or how much faith we think we have. It's about trusting wholly and completely in the one who calms the storm and walks upon the water. When Peter got back in the boat with Jesus, the wind died down and the disciples worshiped Jesus right there in that boat on that sea. They marveled at his power over nature and proclaimed him truly to be the Son of God. It's the right response. Let that be our response when we experience God's saving grace in our lives. When Christ takes us by the hand. Let us acknowledge his power and majesty when he saves us from the storms for Christ's love and protection are stronger than the wind and the waves of your life. Trust in the Lord. He will guide you and he will show you his will. 
He will reach out his hand, and he will lift you up. Amen. And I know that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand as the offerings are brought forward to the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of your power and compassion. As Jesus calmed the storm and walked on water, bring peace and safety, bringing peace and safety to his disciples. As we bring our offerings today, may we trust in your unwavering presence and provision in our lives. Use these gifts to calm the storms of those in need and to spread your message of hope and love. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you have made us your own dear children through holy baptism. Strengthen us with power by your Holy Spirit in our inner being, that your Son may dwell in our hearts through faith, and that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Be glorified in your church and in Christ Jesus. Ground us in love. Give us a faith rooted in the promises of Christ and strength to comprehend with all the saints his love that surpasses all knowledge. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, as you preserved Noah and his family and brought forth new life from the ark under the promise of your covenant, bless now our families also. Make marriages strong and fruitful according to your will. Let your word rule in every home, uniting its members in forgiveness and causing your son to dwell in every heart through faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of might, spare us and future generations from wickedness. Give blessings to our nation and its leaders to rule according to your good pleasure. Protect the members of our armed forces, police, and other public servants. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we, your people, cry out for your healing upon those we lift up to you today, including Arlene, Margaret, Jan, Mary Ellen, Jim, Sherry, Jade, Robert, Larry, Marilyn, Tom, Becky, Jim, Ken, Larry, Dawson, and Anne. Even as you sent your son to heal and make whole, teach them ever to trust in your love, for you never leave nor forsake them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you name every family in heaven and on earth. We give thanks for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labors. Preserve us in the faith so that Christ may dwell in our hearts richly until that day when we join them around your throne. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to do temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We sing together hymn number 718, Jesus, lead thou on.